Hi, my name is Konstantin Baum. I'm a master of wine and this is my channel where we are thirsty for knowledge and wine. Today I'm going to do the highly anticipated second part to my winemaking series. Two months ago I started making my own wine. If you haven't watched the first part of this series then please go back and watch it first because otherwise all of this won't make much sense to you. If you have watched it then let's finish this. Two months ago I pressed the grapes for this wine, fermentation started a few days later and it took roughly three to four weeks until fermentation finished. I left the wine on the yeast for another month to give it a little bit more texture and then I racked the clear wine of the dirty cloudy yeast a few days ago. In order to show you what that looks like we have to travel back into the past. So let's go. So what I'm trying to do here is to separate the clean wine from the yeast on the bottom and I'm going to pour the clean wine into this vessel with this little hose. So let's see. But first of all I want to check how the wine smells. It's roughly 60 days ago since it started fermentation and it stopped fermentation roughly a month ago. So let's see. It smells pretty beautiful. I'm kind of proud. So as you can see here, the clean wine is on top and the yeast are at the bottom. So we want to separate this from that. So this should be relatively easy, but you know what happens when you usually say that. So you need to put the hose in there. I just suck the air out. You can also add stuff to make it easier to separate the wine from the lees, as some people call the yeast but I don't want to add any stuff. But if you would want to add stuff, you could, for example, add egg white to red wine and isinglass to white wine. But yeah, like I said, I'm just trying to do it like this. I could have removed the wine from the yeast quite a bit earlier, but I wanted to leave it a little bit longer on the yeast because the yeast add texture and flavor to the wine. So I just wanted to make sure that it benefits a little bit from that. Some wineries leave the wine on the yeast for a year or even longer. So now you're already starting to see the yeast, so I need to make sure that I don't take up too much of that stuff at the bottom of this little flask. So I've now separated the grossly from the wine and I'm now going to let this settle before bottling it in a few days. Full disclosure, in order to make sure that the wine doesn't oxidize, I actually needed to top it up to the brim and for that I used some of Sven Niger's Riesling Ungeschminkt, which is the same grape variety, different vintage, but pretty much the same vineyards, so that should be fine. So I'm now going to clean this mess up and I'll see you again at the next step of the process. So as you just saw, racking is the process of moving wine from one vessel to another, usually in order to separate the wine from the sediment. We're going to do one last rack with this wine in order to separate it from the little bit of sediment down here and then we're going to bottle the wine. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to remove the little bit of cling film that I put on top of this flask in order to protect the wine and then I'm going to put this into the flask. It's a little hose. Going to suck on it again. <coughs> little taste of my beautiful wine. So now the wine is flowing just as it should and it's going to take a while. So we want to separate the wine from the sediment so make sure that the hose doesn't go all the way down to the bottom otherwise you'll catch all of the sediment. So in the end you might have to tilt the bottle just a little bit in order to get as much wine out as possible. So as you can see here, I'm losing quite a bit of wine because I don't have the perfect equipment here, but I will still drink this tonight. So now the wine is basically ready in the spirit of not trying to add anything. I'm not going to add any sulfur to this wine, which is a bit dangerous because wines can oxidize or re-ferment in bottle if you don't add anything. So if you don't want to risk it, you can certainly add a little bit of sulfur. It won't hurt you and it won't hurt the wine, but I'm trying to stay away from that. So you can obviously buy new bottles. I just decided that I have so many empty old bottles lying around my house that I'm going to recycle them. I took off the labels and then cooked them in water to make sure that they are disinfected. Most wineries would now use a bottling machine. I'm just going back to basic. I'm going to pour this wine into this bottle using a funnel. So let's go. Whoa. 
This is heavy, man. It's kind of important to know when to stop. You wanna leave some room for the cork to go into the bottle and this bottle is clearly too full. So this is more like the level you should be aiming for. So the good thing about pouring is that it gets easier the longer you go. So this worked out pretty much perfectly. I got 12 bottles of wine from my 10 liter flask. So that's enough for a proper party, I guess. So now it's time to seal the bottles with corks. If you follow me on Instagram, you've seen that I went to see Sven Niger again to borrow this beautiful corking machine from him. If you don't follow me on Instagram, then why don't you? Come on, it's free. I'm actually going to add a little bit of argon gas using my Coravin to the wine to protect it from oxygen. And you put the bottle here. Put the cork here and pull. Up. Easy. So I've corked all of the bottles, which was surprisingly easy. And now I just need to put on the labels. So just so you know, this label is actually against all of the labeling rules. So I wouldn't be allowed to sell this wine anywhere on the planet, but that's fine because I'm not going to sell it. On top of that, I actually used some bottles that are protected. I used the bottle that is used in Chateau Neuf du Pape, and I used the Abeza bottle that is only allowed in Piemonte, but I don't care because I'm an outlaw. So all of the bottles are labeled and now I'm just going to let the wine settle in bottle for a few days before tasting it for the first time. So stay tuned for the last part of this video. So it's time. I'm really excited to taste my first wine for the first time. And you're going to be witnessing my reaction to this wine. First of all, I want to let you know after you corked your wine, you need to make sure that you leave the bottle standing upright because the cork still needs to expand a little bit. If you put it down on its side, it might be that some of the wine might leak out. So make sure that you keep them standing upright for a few days just to be sure. So let's do this now. This is my Riesling glass that I'm going to use to taste this beautiful wine. And now I'm going to open the bottle. So I'm sorry that the tablecloth is this dirty, but winemaking is a dirty business. So the cork is out and now I'm going to give myself a little pour. It's 10 o'clock in the morning, which is not the greatest time to drink wine, but it's a very good time to taste wine because your taste buds are still very fresh. So you'll be able to get all of the flavor out of the wine straight away. And I hope there's a lot of flavor in here. So as you can see here, the wine is slightly cloudy, which is because I didn't filter it at all and just did a very light racking of the wine. But um, I don't really mind that. So it's a little bit cloudy, but that's fine. The flavor is very bright and very clear. I'm quite impressed. It's a lot of fresh fruit, uh, green apple, a little bit of peachy flavors. So quite aromatic and intense. On the palate, it is very direct. A lot of fresh acidity, very vibrant, very dry. Some people might say it's a bit too dry. So it's quite, quite tight, quite, quite a lot of acidity. So I'm pretty happy with the result. This wine definitely tastes like Riesling which is quite surprising to me because I wasn't really sure whether this would taste like anything I know, but it tastes quite a bit like Riesling. The texture on the palate is not as concentrated as I would have liked it. So I wouldn't rate this wine very highly because it's just fresh and doesn't have a lot of length, but I'm still really happy with the end result considering that this is my first wine that I've ever made. And I basically just made it at the side in a little balloon somewhere down in my cellar. So if you're thinking about making your own wine, I got three pieces of advice for you. First thing is just do it. I've been thinking about making my own wine for quite a while now, and now I just did it. And it didn't hurt me. It didn't take up too much of my time. And now I got my own wine, which is pretty awesome. The second piece of advice is get some information from someone who's already done it. You've already watched this video, so you know roughly how to do it, but maybe talk to someone who's made wine at home before or talk to a winemaker who really knows a lot about winemaking and he or she might be able to help you along the way. 
And the third piece of advice is just try stuff. There's very little risk involved when you're making wine at home. You don't really have to sell the wine in order to make a living. So you can experiment with different equipment and different processes. I try to avoid all additives. And in the end, I kind of learned how difficult it can be to get fermentation going without any yeast. And maybe I also see that it's difficult to mature the wine without adding any sulfur. I don't know that yet. The wine is perfect right now, but it might turn out to be worse in a few months. So you're just going to learn more if you are pushing the boundaries. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like it down here. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. My question of the day is, are you going to start making your own wine? Let me know down in the comments. I will finish my beautiful wine, maybe not this morning, but tonight. And I hope I see you guys again soon. Until then, stay thirsty.